So thanks for coming on, Kurt. I don't know necessarily where to begin. I just met you in a parking lot um, moments ago, waved you in across the street, and we're happy to have you here. But tell, what, what's what's going on, man? So we got a we got an email saying, "Hey, you want to come on this podcast?" And I was like, "Hey, I've seen those TikToks." Yeah. So, and, um, and when you saw those TikToks, what was your what was your natural feeling? Oh, I thought they were funny. Okay, so I do actually take a bunch of improv in Chicago, and uh, so I'm very like humor is just my my weakness. Wait, are you based in Chicago? Yeah, for now, uh, moving to New Orleans soon. New Orleans? Yeah. Oh, dude, this is gonna be, dude. We're not going to talk about Fly to I.O. at all. <laughs> That's fair. Because I have a note that you play the tuba. I did used to play the tuba, yeah. It's been a while. Okay, because if you're going to New Orleans, one thing about New Orleans, having lived in New Orleans, it is the only city in America where you will hear the tuba once a day. It's true. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a big, it's a, that's why we're moving, honestly. No. It, well, it's, it's a huge reason. It's it's absolutely yeah, a wonderful place. Epic. So, okay, we're building out... We're building out our new studio and office space in Chicago. Yep. Um, for those listening, we're in Miami right now. Uh, we're in our local studio, but we're going to be um, building out in Chicago. It's a great city. It is. Also love Chicago. It's a great city. It's a city where it's a city that works. It is, is, yeah. The, is the and old the school slogan. Excellent. The food Cheap is excellent. Food, expensive food. Cheap food. You get it all. Yeah. Yeah, Chicago is one of those places where you slowly miss New York a little less. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> You're like, I don't need to be in New York for this. This yeah. is cleaner and a little cheaper. All when right. You, when you live in Chicago, you go to New York and you're like, why is there garbage on the sidewalks? Yeah, I don't understand. There's no alleys. Right, 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 right. Chicago, you have the alley system where all the nasty stuff gets tucked around the corner. Just pretend it's not there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like all the other things in Chicago that we won't talk about. <laughs> right, we exactly. pretend it's not there. Lots of pretending it's not there. Yeah. So, okay, you're headed. Why Why New Orleans? Uh, working at a remote company or like founding a remote company is interesting because you're really not tethered to a city. And and um, I used to have to spend a lot of time in San Francisco. And in COVID, I was like, why? Well, it's not worth it. It's, it yeah. didn't, doesn't matter anymore. And so we... Um, when you're kind of freed up to live where you want, it gets, it's, it becomes an interesting choice. So it's really like 12 reasons. And so we've got some family there and that's okay. important. A house came up for sale, like right down the block from them. Okay. Um, but there's, we also tend to try to move instead of traveling. So fly IO is de completely decentralized. Yeah. We're like wildly remote. We have people in South Africa. We have people in South America. Uh, there's like 65 of us in probably 25 different countries. 65 people all yeah. over the world. Yep. How do you manage a team that's, that's so disparate across all time zones. How do, what's um, the strategy there? I don't know yet, but so far we've been working. Yeah. Our, our last company was remote um, before COVID, which was rarer. Um, and we have some ideas and we have some things that seem to work, but it's it's an effort. It's like a it's like a grind to make it work well. I think uh, in a, in a way that being co-located doesn't make you feel so like you have to be very intentional about mm -hmm. about like how you set expectations for people. Mm -hmm. um, what, what you kind of want from them. And then there's this whole element of work has to happen. Uh, you have to be like, you have to have people make independent decisions and make good choices, but also work well asynchronously with other people. So one of the things we've been hammering on is um, this whole idea of like, don't wait for consensus, just mm. do things and do because it. Because you almost can't wait for you consensus. Can't. So slow. You would die. It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work at all in yeah. this kind of environment. We actually, um, I don't know how much you know about software development in general, but it's, it actually becomes very similar to how like open source projects work uh -huh. where you have uh, kind of a shared place to work. There's a lot of writing uh -huh. um, and, and mostly people are doing kind of small units of work in a way that um, is less risky and it, it, it gets in front of other people quicker. It, it's less risky because it's segmented off into a corner that they're working on. So if there was an issue, the entire infrastructure wouldn't yeah, pretty, it, crumble. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it it's, I would say yeah. it's it's less technically risky for that reason, less business risky. So one of the things we hammer on people is to put their work in front of users, which you probably, yeah. it's probably not all that different than what you do. Right. Where it, it's like uh, just getting things out in front of the people who care about it all the time as and getting habit, feedback and getting feedback and then adjusting to that is like the only, I think it might actually make us a better company because we're, we're having to be forced to do this. Might. Basically. Well, so yeah. <laughs> rapid the, iteration the jury's out right now. We're just really good at raising money and less good at turning into a huge viable business. I so. see. <laughs> Let's do it. See, see Kurt, 
People describe what that means to folks who haven't gone through a program like a YC and raised their first slug, meaning like it's not the way that this this process that you're building this iteration. Right. This is very different than bootstrapping in your in your basement. And there's it's capital intensive. You need to hire a lot of people before necessarily you're pulling in the revenue that's naturally supporting the business. So walk me through that, because people don't understand. Like there's two ways to there's a million ways to build a business. But this is a this is one of (laughs) those very distinct. Um, So actually, the the last company we did was was closer to bootstrapped where we kind of worked on interesting projects. And then one of them just accidentally became successful. We didn't really have to, um, we didn't decide to create a startup. We worked on a product. People started paying for it. Um, revenue started happening. We did go raise money to try and accelerate it faster, but it was always a very small, uh, kind of vision. So we would basically put, put still, still incremental, but we, we grew that to like $15 million of revenue. Um, yeah. And then, um, what I found, we sold that company to IBM. And then what actually, what was interesting was I, this was the first company I've deliberately tried to start as a startup. Ah. Everything else has been, I've had lots of failed attempts at things, but it's all been much smaller right. and much more, um, much more bootstrappy. Um, and what, what we did this time that worked unintentionally. I trust you a lot more now, just so you know. Like I the just companies failed? <laughs> no, I trust people that have had a lot of contact with reality and have, have lived bootstrap because- yeah. I don't know. I'm a little skeptical of those that are just really good at raising shit tons of money on crazy oh, ideas. Yeah. No, it's uh, it is a, especially with like the wave of crypto stuff. You got a lot of like serious grift. You got a lot of people make with the wrong doing the wrong thing. And yeah, I think that um, no, we're old and jaded. And I love it. And you're a, I'm very cynical about startups. You're a man after my own heart, Kurt. That is the what is I, yeah. that's how I like to hear it. So, so this our, this company started with funding because yep. I found that when you sell your company, investors just write you basically a blank check for your next. They're company. like, you Once. you do this again. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, no, we'll just fund whatever you're doing. I was like, I haven't even told you. I was like, that doesn't. They're it's like, fine. just take the money, asshole. Yeah. And so we did, but this is 2017, and then it was like, ah, okay, and it didn't work, and uh-huh. it just kept not working. Yeah, uh, and it took us three years to figure out um, the, kind of the right product we think for the big market we were after and then um for us the money the funding came because of the market size and because we kind of have some proof that we can we're basically competing with amazon and what happened Uh. is investors (laughs) started buying that this was true and not just a stupid thing to be saying i see got to be a very interesting um thing for them and so we raise money now because they they look there this is one of those companies that if it's successful it's like unlimited value. The upside is not, there's not like, usually they talk about TAM, like the total addressable market. Yeah. And company, companies pitch like, well, this could be a billion dollar company in some days. And then if you're actually credibly competing as Amazon, it's a trillion. It's like actually it's such a big thing that investors are like, I got to gamble on this. Or, I see. Because if it goes well, they it's a FOMO problem, basically. They, uh-huh. they don't want to miss out on this if it works. Even though it probably won't. Basically. Right. Well, it's a roulette. It's a roulette spin with a 20,000 to one odd. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like the, if you win, you win so big, you never have to play ever again for the rest of your life. Yes, exactly. Basically. And what you're building is I'm going to I'm going to fuck this up and then you're going to correct fine. me. Uh, you're building co-located servers all over the world. All over the world. Yes. The, um, the fundamental problem we're solving is the speed of light is too slow. Meaning fiber optic. Yeah. So um, from here to Sydney and back is like 400 milliseconds. And lag. Yeah, a lag. Exactly. So if you're, yeah, for, if you've ever played a game, that's like entirely unacceptable. But it's actually I unacceptable. How about if you've ever built trading systems? Oh, yeah, like exactly. Have, oh, yeah. my God. That's a whole different scale. Yeah, we dug latency. up. see that we have an issue. <laughs> yeah, we would dig up holes underneath the exchange and run our own fiber. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Or the, or the, I love the, um, uh, I remember reading about, I used to work for a site called Ars Technica and we covered all this stuff about people setting up these microwave. Oh yeah. On like not their land. It was like actually kind of, there were all these lawsuits and things. Cause they were like, whoop, do to sneak a little so microwave. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wait, we got to explain this to people. So if you've ever heard of high frequency trading, if you ever wonder why every time you go to, you know, buy your little, your 10 shares of Tesla or whatever, it always goes against you, right? Like the retail, the retail investor always seems to make buy the wrong tick. There's so much computational power that you have no fucking idea of behind the scenes. Who owns this stuff? Well, it used to be me. Uh, (laughs) Uh, 
It used to be I me. Trust you less now. Uh, you right. <laughs> hey, I'm, at least I'm honest it's about true. it. It's true. So when I was building my business, um, I was bringing high frequency trading concepts, which is an equity trading, meaning stocks uh, concept. I was bringing that to the bond market, which is the um, pterodactyl, uh, fucking tri- you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex, the old b- b- dinosaur bone market, where there isn't much. Um, Compute computational power as compared to stocks. Right. The volume's not there or whatever. Um, you could, like, the bond market, you used to have to pick up the fucking phone. Let's put it that way, right? Okay. And you still had to pick up the phone while stocks were be tr- being traded computer to computer, right? So what I would do is um, we... To do what I was doing, which was uh, low latency arb trading, trading two things at once and picking off pennies, little tiny, little tiny pennies. What I would do to get that done is I had to be the fastest gun in town. Uh, the fastest gun in town means in the milliseconds. We what we knew what our round trip time was to Chicago, and we knew what our round trip time was to whatever fucking exchange we were buying and selling from. Okay, how do you beat Goldman Sachs? Well, you know what their latency is from an approximation, uh, and then we dig fiber and we uh, basically sit right next to the exchange. Uh, and so maybe my screen doesn't reflect the trade as quickly, but it's been actually traded at a co-location right. center, meaning a bunch of servers sitting really close to the exchange in Chicago. Now, if everyone wants to know how Nick Crown made his money a couple years ago, that's exactly how I fucking did it. OK, I was faster than the next guy. Um, and uh, sorry, Goldman, you know, I got gotcha. you. Very sad. And now, you know, <laughs> OK, back to the. So we're, we're like that, but for eyeballs. So the idea here is that if you if you do something in an app on your phone or on your desktop or even for your, your work app, uh, when you click a button, you want something to happen and it, you want it to be instantaneous. And that's in, like increasingly not true, particularly when you get to like Australia. And so the Internet experience in Australia and and Japan and India and Singapore is way worse than it is in the U.S. Because of the, the water. Yeah, because it, yeah, and it's just like <laughs> literally light is slow. It's, that's it. Wow. Yeah. So when and and we can talk about why when you click something you expect something to happen. And by the way, if it doesn't happen, the conversion rates go exactly. Poof. Yep. Meaning, I don't want to wait. I'm not going to buy the football anymore. Right. Right. And even more, I think that um, lately there's this expectation. I think we're getting kind of everyone has a a much higher bar for what they want for all of their application experiences. To the point where um, it may not even be conversion related. It may be does it even actually engage with your application. Mm. Like, do you actually do people are people frustrated by it or not when they when they join? Right. Uh, there's uh, welcome to Miami, by the way. Thank you. Uh, there is a ne- network of th- uh, city bikes here, yep. um, and these city bikes are one of the greatest things in the entire world because it's the, one of the few cities. Uh, if you're on the beach, uh, that you take a city bike around, you could explore nature. You're probably not going to get hit by a vehicle the same way that you'd get hit by a vehicle in New York. Actually, I'm not guaranteeing that. Right. <laughs> uh, the, dri- the skill of driving in New York is uh, quite a bit uh, two standard deviations higher than the skill of driving here in Miami. But the bottom line is there is an app that powers the ecosystem of the city bike. Yep. And um, when I say it has lag in between every single action you take, <laughs> it makes me almost not want to take that bike out, even right. though I'll enjoy the nature. Uh, one of the more frustrating things about having just meaningless lag, and this thing probably isn't even, I don't know. I don't know what it's doing. It's I don't know if it's communicating to a server. It's just built like shit. Uh, but, <laughs> but the frustration of I press the button and it doesn't do the thing, in as we move into the future becomes more and more unacceptable right exactly and what we what we basically offer is the easiest thing to do is move the server closer to people you you don't have to fix your app necessarily move the box yeah and so we have servers in miami and if they were hosting they're they're probably running in virginia which is 80 90 milliseconds away round trips right the human apparently human perception is sub 100 milliseconds looks instantaneous uh-huh. Um, and the reality is, is when you're dealing on the internet, like you want to get sub 40 most of the time. So most things are still sub hundred milliseconds. I see. So it's not like high frequency training where it's like sub millisecond is really what you have. Right. It's still order, but it's still very fast. Right. Right. It, it, when you're the difference, by the way, the, why it would matter in high frequency trading is high frequency trading means if it's slow, it doesn't happen. Right. Whereas us, it's slow. It annoys us. We might click away, yep. but it still happened. Probably. Yeah. There's yeah. a, there's a little bit, you're right. There's a little bit of a reliability story there where slow and maybe broken mm. are, are frequently look the same to okay. a, to like a device, but it's um, generally the, the frustrations, the factor that people are after here. Let's describe the architecture of AWS. Um, AWS has mega hubs yep. throughout the U S 
And what you guys are doing is you have more granularity, meaning you have more micro hubs. We, uh, something close to that. AWS is, um, AWS is basically old school data centers moved to software in the same place. So each one of their cities is pretty much independent. It's very difficult to run a single application across all of AWS's regions. Because you have to select, I want to run this out of the West Coast, the East Coast, New York 1, New York 2. And so what you're saying is, hey, we can simultaneously run this app across a variety of geography? That's exactly right. It's it's basically one command to extend your app into a place like Madrid, for example, if you're doing a Madrid launch for uh, for to go into that new market. And nobody else is doing this? Not in the way we are. Um, I think the interesting thing about the problem space for us is there's a, a there's a public company called Cloudflare. Uh huh. I've heard of them. They, yeah. they they have the they've kind of tackled the same problem in the wrong way. Uh, I think we're kind of confidently saying that at this point. I think I don't I don't know if I would have said that so bluntly two years ago, but um, what we're actually doing is we're trying to make the apps that people are currently building work all over the world. And what Cloudflare is doing is trying to make you build entirely new applications that work specifically on Cloudflare. Well, the thing with Cloudflare is, isn't Cloudflare like manually redirecting you somewhere else? They're like, hey, uh, you're, where are you? <laughs> it takes a second, right? right? Where are you? I'm in New York. Oh, shit. We're using the server from Los Angeles or whatever. Let's change you over to this other server. Is that how that Cloudflare is working? They do some of it. I think the um, the biggest what they're actually doing, and they, where they started was from a security company. They protect your app against DDoS attacks and things, which if J- you are on social media, you've probably been attacked by some random trolls on a Telegram group somewhere. Um, which is just like traffic, spam traffic, yeah, hits onto your... It's basically like sending you you know, 4,000 pounds of mail. Yeah, which will blow up your mailbox. Exactly. And then you have to filter through it, and you're probably going to miss the check that someone sent you. Yeah. Big problem. I created, uh, back in the day when I was a little kid, I created a little hacking program that would send people 4,000 pieces of email. Oh, yeah. we. Uh, Did you do that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, uh, I, I, don't, I feel like the, the little bit of naughty stuff is, is kind of the entry point to some of this. It's like, I want to try this. And then you get older, you're like, that, I was being an asshole. But that, <laughs> <laughs> well, having, you know, I've, I've spoken to so many YC alum that I had to start reading Paul Graham. Also, I just heard that Paul Graham was a really great writer. So I read Paul Graham. I ripped through, um, was it Hackers and Painters? Yep. uh, The collection of essays. And his argument is that um, naughtiness is a foundational tenet of being a hacker, meaning to even do this shit, you have to be naughty. Naughty is exploring boundaries. Right. Um, It's exploring what's possible. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes it's discovering what you didn't know was possible is possible. So there's a there's a beautiful thing about that. I I I've just recently uh, I think I mentioned my hacking programs uh, on a a pod a few weeks ago. I don't remember when when it was. And I just I realized how important it was that I did I did that little stupid thing in my basement um, when my mom would get on the phone and you'd hear her coming through the modem. (laughs) <laughs> modem remember, noises. remember that nobody's gonna know what you're talking about oh my god <laughs> so the way a modem worked you would share the line into your main family house with the computer so if mom picked up the phone you would you could, number one get kicked off online. Oh, the internet would just stop just, just stop so whatever you're doing which at that point let's be honest was not important right at all no, it, it felt important <laughs> it felt like, important Mom. Come on. <laughs> and then you'd get kicked off. And there was, there was this weird phenomenon because I think um, the telephony, I don't know if that's the right word, in those days operated by sound. Yep. So like it was sending data with like sounds. Roughly, yeah. That's like, exactly, yeah. Beep, 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 beep. So you'd hear the data. It was very strange. You'd hear data. Yep. Unbelievable. But it, what that also meant was you'd hear your mom pick up the phone and go like, hello, yep. hello. And she'd do that. She'd hold the phone up to her head and it'd screech at her. And so she'd go like this, <laughs> like immediately. It was, yep. It was slow as crap, too. I remember I went to college and had fiber optic. I was like, oh, my God, this is the future. Yeah. And then you like, all my wares. maybe one day I'll build it for everybody. Yes. That that I don't know when I started thinking that. But yeah. <laughs> when did you start thinking that? Um, I think this company is the first time. I deliberately picked something that seemed big instead of trying to, to be scrappy. Um, uh-huh. um, why did you decide to be big? Because you knew you could get away with it now. I don't, I'll give you the, the, the artificial make me sound good reason. No, 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 no. <laughs> Fuck that reason. <laughs> well, okay. I was allowed to do something big cause yeah. we've done something before and we had agreed. We didn't, um, 
we'd made money on the last company. We right. had no mortgage. It was just like, it was pretty comfortable. Yeah. Um, I think the reality is that I learned at the previous company that my, my, um, my personality is not a bootstrapping personality. I'm ah. happier if I'm trying to push things as hard as they can go. So you got away with being a bootstrapper, basically. It was the only choice when we had no money and no <laughs> sure. connections. And, and like, Everyone like, forgets. That's what I had to do. So, um, yeah. And right. I think um, I think the last company taught me a lot about myself that I didn't know was true. Mm -hmm. Like one of those was, um, I don't want to run a small company. I wanted to actually, I'm happier um, if I take on the biggest possible thing I can think of. And I'm happier with the idea of that failing mm. that, and because I can do something else. It's yeah. like that. Um, and then the, the stupid thing I learned was I, I thought I was the type of person that wouldn't like to look at me or that I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't, didn't want attention from having like a nice car. Uh -huh. And then I got a nice car. I was like, oh, I actually do like it when people look at me in my car. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. So you're like, you, it's one of those things because you're, you can just say, hey, I'm lucky to have just been able to do the first thing. Let me, let me not push my luck. Yeah. Let me not, you know, tempt the fates. Let me, well, I'm just going to stay in my lane or I'll do this the same way again. And you're like, well, no, I recognized emotions through an emo the discovery process or yep. I actually want to run a big fucking company. Yeah, that was, uh, I think that I actually explored being an investor because that's the stereotypical thing to do. It is. Hated that. Just it's not, not really, the work I wanted to be doing. Yeah. It's like, oh my God. It's, well, it's not, too boring. It's it's boring and it's so much of like, I, I think I'm pretty introverted. I'd rather build things and talk to people. Yeah. That, that's a rule. And investing is like, that's hard. Those people are are doing hard work at all times and no part of me got energy for that. So. <laughs> well, because what everyone thinks an investor is this like, like the the like in this ivory like this beautiful mahogany office ivory tower just like uh i'm the center of wisdom it's like investors are fucking calling guys like you on the phone all day and asking them what's hey yeah. what's going on yeah. what are you guys doing you and sure i'm you ignoring do? their emails and it's, it's you're ignoring them they're trying to get a hold of you to decide if they're going to get their money back ever it's a very per interpersonal job I mean, for the people that actually make a lot of money for these, you know, these, these people on TikTok that are like, come and see my Forex trade. It's like, no, <laughs> dude, those people don't make any money because they don't have any fucking information. The whole, right. anyway, we're not going to go we, down that rabbit hole. I got, uh, this company has been interesting because it's been a sequence. The whole, the whole reason I did Y Combinator, I did it in 2011, then we did it again in 2020. And the whole reason. And you I, probably didn't need to do it. Uh, it was surprisingly more useful than I thought. Okay. I, I was, I was kind of, I was like, I know everything and it turns out I don't. Um, so how they, was it useful? They, um, I think the interesting thing there is the partners there have seen, now they see like a thousand companies a year. And so I the had, data set just gets yeah, big as fuck. I had one company that went pretty okay and, and uh -huh. changed my life, but it was like pretty mediocre in startup terms and they've seen everything and I've seen one. And so the interesting thing there was actually, um, they, they kind of, I got to talk into a few times about some things that I had. I was like, oh, we're going to do this. And they're like, that's stupid. Don't do that. And it was uh, way more interesting than I expected. So you have this kind of like godfather character in the room. That's like, I've literally seen you guys come and go every year. And that thing that you're about to do is a bad yes. idea. Yeah, exactly. Actually, uh, Paul Graham was in, he was our, I did office hours with him in 2011. And one of the things I remember him telling the company, a different company, not us, um, I was old and took it seriously. And there were a bunch of 20 year old students who I was like, you're not taking this as seriously. Like, this is my it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he told one of them, he's like, this is why we fund so many companies. You can just drive yours off a cliff and we'll be fine. Cause someone who was just making kind of poor choices. It felt uh, like, um, which I thought was super interesting. Well, he's playing, he's, he's structuring to make the best possible environment, but he's still playing the numbers. Right. Meaning he hands a check to a thousand people and three come back and pay for the Everybody else exactly. is fuck ups. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's a, uh, even at the top, that's still the business model that seems to work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> so what was interesting about, um, me not wanting to be an investor is our last round of funding. Um, I live in Chicago and I just don't talk to investors because I don't want to. Um, and I'm, it's probably a bad thing. Like if, if the company wasn't working, Do you, actually hurt you me. also have, have had an exit. I'm assuming there's some bucks in the back. You also kind of don't fucking feel like you have to do that. Right. That's, um, yeah, I it's think that maybe fuck you money type of thing that happens. Yeah. So there's, um, th there's a, a lot of that. Actually, someone, the best compliment I ever got was like, Kurt, your level of fuck you money is like $800. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, I, I don't know how much of that, that I like to help versus I'm just like, uh, don't like being told what uh -huh. to do. Um, uh -huh. but the, um, uh, 
this company, the fundraising of this company has been interesting and it taught me how much I don't want to be an investor uh -huh. because um, first we failed to raise money at least twice that I can remember, which sucks. I hate it. It's like yeah. um, what, what, doing improv in Chicago. I've gone to auditions and been turned down. It's like equally terrible. It's the same. Yeah. Like just it sucks. Well, it feels like someone's negating your identity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what, the flip side of this was they started chasing us at one point and I realized how hard they have to work for the companies that they think are special <laughs> when one of them, I wasn't responding. One of them finally emailed me a whole list of user interviews they'd done and said, I'm coming to Chicago. Can we eat and look these over? I was like, that's, that's some sure. Okay. <laughs> we'll just go right next door to where I'm working from and, and yeah. hang out. And then I told another one this was happening. And then 12 firms flew to Chicago that Holy week. Holy shit. It, I was like, oh my it's God. It's a feeding is, frenzy. It was. And I, you just saw them. They just dropped their whole life to come do this thing that I'm kind of like, that's bananas. Like, I, I don't know what's happening right now. This is never going to happen to us again. Uh, yeah. But I don't want to do that. And that sounds terrible. It, it does. <laughs> it certainly <laughs> does sound terrible. <laughs> well, it's there's so few good deals that when they see or they see social proof, let's when they get conviction, conviction, that's their, that's their word, right? When whether it's true conviction. or not. Yeah, exactly. Because for, for, for I mean, dude, we've all seen these asinine things that keep get funded with i don't want to say asinine because it doesn't matter if i believe in the idea or not but we see the wrong teams yep. the wrong personalities we see bravado in all the wrong directions and we're just like this isn't gonna work out right um we see that stuff happen all the time but um fundraising is a strange freaky nonsensical oh, bizarre no little sense. thing it's such a you know the one that the most interesting thing i've noticed with these is when they um and someone finally explained this to me they, they're such herd animal. The investors are such herd animals about the next big market or the next big idea. And so yeah. crypto was that for a while, um, which was, I think wrong. We've, there's been sort of, I think it, there's interesting stuff there. I don't think it's the next Facebook. And what I learned was happening was all of these firms felt like they'd missed social media back in like 2009, 2008 to 2012. And what they, what the, what they're all looking for is the market that makes the firm. And so crypto could have been that. And so you guys saw a ton of money in there. Now it's AI, which I think is probably more credible. Way more credible. But yeah. hey, I'm talking my own book. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh it's I mean it, it's full of grift also, but it 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 looks like a it looks like a game. At changer. least it does your homework for you. Right, exactly. Okay. It's like I've done things with, with AI and like, wow, that's that's interesting. I have it edit my stuff now. Every time I write, I just run it through ChatGPT. When's the last time Dogecoin did anything for you? I, I don't know. I mean, if I owned any, maybe when Elon put it on top of Twitter. That's the other fucking day. awesome. <laughs> Dude, I just don't, I'm loving. He's like, I get an email the other day, well, because everyone did. It's not like Elon. No, just, just you specifically. Yeah. Just me. <laughs> uh, he's like, by the way, Twitter is called X now. I like, saw that. It's like, just, just know that. So like we might still call Twitter, but just know that the parent company is called X and maybe it won't be called Twitter anymore. And just just know that that's a thing now. And you're like, what the fuck? Like, it's amazing. <laughs> it's so entertaining. It's, it's so like you're entertaining. watching a train wreck. Half the time. It's so entertaining. Oh, you know, his man. PayPal was called X. So maybe he's just just trying to. It It's just. Well, we're going to go no, down yeah. a rabbit hole there. No Let's crypto, go back to no, no Twitter. No, it's a whole talk by itself. That's for someone else's podcast. <laughs> that's for like a, yeah, an alpha male podcast. No, I'd rather keep throwing shade at investors. I think that's much more. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Let's keep going on this. Let's keep going on this. Well, what we're exposing and it's not to pick on investors. It's any industry where there's limited opportunity. They seem to cluster and then you have to go and get the fucking deals. Yep. And if there's only a few deals and Hey, you're like, Wait, oh, everyone's talking about this company? Well, guess what? You're not going to get promoted if you don't fly down and get a piece for a piece yeah. of it for yourself. So can you blame these guys? It's just, it's the nature of the business. Right, right it really is. And you could, uh, I learned, I figured, I started figuring out who was talking to me just because they had to very quickly. It was super interesting. Meaning, my boss told me to come down here. That's Meaning, why I'm here. Or even, I feel like I have to, and I'm not actually super into this, but uh, I'm missing something. The, the FOMO stuff is, it's very... Investors are, I think it's a terrifying job because the, the fear of missing the thing means that you have to go look and decide against it or you're going to feel bad about it. It's not even a, the, just not, not having a, a, a bite at the apple or whatever you want to call it is the, is the biggest thing they're scared of. Right. Because in the nature of the business of a thousand, uh, you know, one to 20,000 bet dollar, but dollar bets, which is the roulette game. If you miss the thing, you don't. You f you basically miss a uh, thirty to forty years of 
of revenue and profit. Right. Like you, you're, you've basically put yourself out of business. Yep. If you miss the one thing, you've put yourself out of business forever, technically, from a return. There's standpoint. one, uh, there's a firm called Bessemer Venture Partners as an anti-portfolio that's worth reading because they talk about all their misses and it's such a, such a power move to be really? like, we missed on Facebook, we missed on Slack, we missed on things and we're still crushing it. Uh, uh, I thought, I, I think that I actually really like that they did that. And I think it says a lot about, cause it's, you, it's not so much you can't miss the one. It's that you better find one of those. It's a, it's a, I see. It's a, it's a really interesting set of incentives. Right. You better find a one. Exactly. Whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Facebook as long as it's something. Yeah. And then you go back later and be like, ah, oh, I missed out on Facebook. Stupid me. And then drive right. off in your Ferrari or whatever. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, right. To go, go get, go to a crawfish boil in new Orleans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Too bad for me. Too bad for me. I guess I missed that one. Wow. So, okay. So you have this feeding frenzy moment. What happens, dude? I learned a lot. It was, I was really like, I keep saying this, the most interesting thing is experiencing new stuff about startups for me. And I'm surprised how much new is happening in this one. So, um, with this in particular, one of the things that they were noticing was we just got really popular amongst developers on the internet for reasons entirely okay. outside of our control. It wasn't anything we did at that point. You guys went quote unquote viral amongst the niche community. Yeah, we had an inflection point. If okay. you're an investor, you got to always draw the graph in the air when you say inflection right. point. You're like, that's a hockey stick. good thing. Um, <laughs> and so two things happened. One is investors love to tell you you should be careful about your valuation because um, there's some truth to it, but it's not the most uh honest thing they can tell you i don't think while they're trying to get the deal <laughs> they're like you guys are being yeah. a little but hey after we give you the money after yeah. we give you the money then we're gonna fucking tell you that you were right all along yeah we um we got lucky and got a very early offer from someone at a valuation i was happy with okay and i just started telling everyone else that i'm not going to talk to them unless they're going to do like 2x that it was just right. a, it became a very interesting filter um i and, see and we ended up finding two people that that like the the we're like yeah this is if it goes well I'm not going to care which uh -huh. I thought was um, very fascinating uh, so that was a thing I'm going to do now I think if I ever every time this happens I'm like oh I'm never going to feel that again like having this feeding frenzy for my company that's probably like a unicorn event this is uh -huh. not ever going to happen to us again uh -huh. but if it did I would I would definitely start pushing on them I would actually try and filter investors early because I think that um, in some ways you're looking for the right person and not just the money. And right. I think that um, at our last company, we had some difficult times with a board member. And I think that that might've been partly why it was like a. Talk to me through what the right person looks like. So someone who is a, a providing an insight that perhaps you might not have. Right. They have. I think there's a, um, no, there's the first do no evil problem, which is investors can really screw a company I mean, just up. stay the fuck out of the yeah. good stuff. It's like neutral is a good start. So let's not mess anything up. Okay. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with their, their kind of, have they, have they like consumed the Kool-Aid thing, both in terms of what you think the market is, how the product should work, uh -huh. and then also how you expect to sell it. This, okay. is, this is where I've run into problems the most, is we have a very strong take on how this should be sold, how the go-to-market should happen. And for us, um, finding investors that had thoroughly bought into that idea was mm. very important because it's very different than what some of them would prescribe. It's very different from what some of Oracle would say to do. And right. it's both right for us and also right for me doing the other thing would be very awkward. It wouldn't, okay. it wouldn't work. And so that, that was, um, at our last company, it was a little bit of that problem. We had a thing that I thought was working. It was, we, we had like a plan for the next couple of years. It seemed like this was working the way we wanted it to. And it was never right for the investor. Uh -huh. And so that's the do no evil thing. It's like at the very least, like just be, you're a cheerleader. You right. gotta be happy with us. You have to know we have more context than everyone else. Right. Uh, you're not running a company because you're probably too scared. That's it. Not, <laughs> that's fighting words <laughs> yeah exactly um and then um, well, it's a different skill set it is that's like owning a supermarket and then assuming that you can duck behind the butcher counter and take a cow down exactly and turn it into a porterhouse yes yeah. you know it like dude come on yeah don't kid it, yourself it, it's a right? and hey let's be honest it's a just as the same that the butcher who's broke the cow down shouldn't go and run the Grocery store. Probably not. Not yet. Maybe not yet. someday. Maybe I don't know. Develop. It seems like it's more likely to go that direction than the other one. You're <laughs> actually 100% right. Oh, man, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. This is beautiful. Uh, yes. You're probably right there. Uh, okay. So I completely see why this makes sense. It's What's funny is like these are those moments where you're, where you're like... <laughs> You don't have too many at bats when 12 people show up. Like, right. it's not like you go, oh, I know how this goes. 
No. 12 people always show up trying to hand me millions shit, of dollars. I don't know what I'm supposed to do right You're like, now. I don't even know what, uh, had to, should I be polite? Should I be pissed? Should I yeah. be uh, distant? Should I play hard to get? I don't even know what you're supposed to do. No, I, I don't either. And I'm not even sure I still do. I was just, because uh, we didn't need them. I think that the, the most powerful thing ever is just not needing them. Yeah. And um, Well, in life, just not needing whatever it is. Exactly. Is the power move. And it's not even a, it's not even a thing I can fake. Like if I, I don't think you can fake it. It's like, it's, <laughs> I know that I know you're supposed to act it, but I'm like, I've never acted it unless it's been true. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think that we put off the vibe of like, we're happy to talk to you, but this is not important right now. Right. Um, and I think it made, it made some of them feel like there was a chance to really pitch themselves uh-huh. to us, um, which was good. Um, but I don't know how to go next time. I don't know if there will be a next time. Right. That's the weirdest dynamic difference between investors and founders. Right. They have perhaps, Hundreds of at bats. Yeah, this might be my last one. I may never get to do this again. Yeah, and, and they're going to look at forty companies this year, and they're going to fly in and have to take you out to lunch yeah. and do the same. Sh- you know, <sighs> they're used to it. It's their armchair moment. Yeah. For you, you're like, I, I don't even know what the fuck is happening right, right now. And I'm probably not doing something I feel like is important because I'm doing this instead. That's the that's the thing that's always uh, been a struggle for me. Right, right. So what you 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 end up finding the right partner through this moment. Yes. Um, and I think one of the things I've since learned, I used to think investors are either harmful or neutral and there wasn't a lot of upside. Um, I think that there are a few that are really well connected and in a way that's relevant to us. I think one problem they have is they all have their networks and if their network isn't important to our business, it's actually not useful, but we've found a few now that have very, very good connections into the types of places we want to talk. They have very good connections and the type of people we want to hire. Mm Mm-hmm which has been, that's new again. Right. It's, it's not just cut me the check. It's like, well, what other businesses that use this type of infrastructure would be interested in working with yeah. us? And we have one who's yeah. aggressively pitching us as like a, basically trying to sell us to companies. I was like, oh, obviously investors should do that. That is a thing to look for. Right. It's like, how much are you going to push us to, to companies that you think? It's not even a, again, not fake. He, he's entirely bought in. He yeah. genuinely believes all the companies should be using us. Right. But it, it was a first for me seeing someone like, basically overwhelm me with leads was very interesting. That's fantastic. It's because basically what they're doing is they're saying, Hey, here's some money and uh, the rest of it will come from customers. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's spectacular. It's actually a, it's a loop. It's like, here's some money. When we see it from customers, there'll be more money. Um, so we're shipping GPUs right now for, uh, which is what the, all the AI companies need yeah. to um, do generative AI basically. And we've been, the investors have been pushing us to do that. They're like, we think the market needs it. It's expensive. Uh, we got your back. I was like, okay, cool. Let's, let's give that a try. It's, That's a good, it's a good big swing. The bottleneck to AI is computational power. Yeah. Um, and it's specific. It's actually a different kind of, it's since it's the GPUs, um, and I'm not even technical enough to explain deeply why this is all this different, but it's actually the type of computational power that um, people haven't needed for hosting their apps historically. Can you, exp- when we think of CPU versus GPU, that's what we're talking about here? Yeah. And uh, that, I think the best way to think about it is CPUs are very general purpose and you could do a lot of AI stuff on it. It would just uh-huh. take years and GPUs are very specialized. Um, and uh, it's, it's very, it's much faster. It's like orders of magnitude faster than okay. running the same workloads on CPUs. Right. And for things like OpenAI, they need, they're talking about they're talking about doing like trillions of iterations on things at this point. Like it has to happen, and it's still going to take them six months, basically. So, wow. So everyone is using ChatGPT, right? So let me give you a little bit of an advanced technique. It's it's a uh, one tick further than the ChatGPT, right? It's called um, it's called the slang is called multi shot. It's you give it a few examples mm-hmm. and then. Give me the third. Give me yep. the fourth. Give me the fifth. However many examples. And guys, you can do this. If you have an open AI API account, you, you apply for one. It's not expensive if you get access to it. I think it's probably gated now. I I have it through, obviously, my AI company. But yeah, yeah. You should be able to get this thing. Okay? Yeah, it seems pretty available. Yeah. It, it's Now, what, what's going to happen is there's something called the playground, uh, the sandbox environment. This is where it's uh, kind of like the, your old friend, ChatGPT, but now you can prompt it in more complicated ways. You can provide a lot more context. And basically, what you're going to do here is uh, this thing called multi-shot. So, if you have a style of writing or you have these ideas and you've have previous previous examples of your own ideas, right. you can basically say, I did this this way. I did this this way. I did this this way. Maybe you categorize them and you say, do it again. Right. 
kind of like how the way that, that I did it. Yep. And it's a non-code, really quick and cheap and dirty way to get output that miraculously mirrors your syntax, your tone, your... I think multi-shot is uh, where it's at for the armchair AI person. We actually, um, we do a bunch of take-home hiring exercises and we've run them through basically that process to mm. let it generate responses for us to see how good they can be. Oh, wow. Because I'm, I'm actually, I feel like the, um, I feel like this is a difficult problem to solve for hire for companies when they're hiring is to, is to actually find a human who's doing things. Um, if you, if you kind of give people a thing that the AI can solve for them. Certainly now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like any writing sample, I think is at risk of being chat GPT generated. Sure. So we were lucky cause we fed it a bunch and, its responses wouldn't have passed. So I was like, all right, I feel better about that. I'm sure it won't always be that way. Right. But uh, that that was fun. I think we've been th thinking about feeding it actual responses that we think are good and seeing how, how, how far we can push it. Okay. But it's a, it's kind of a scary thing. Scary and also exciting. I mean, exciting. it's scary sighting. It's both of those. <laughs> You're like, I'm so scared, but I'm so yeah, happy. Like, I have no idea what's going to happen right now, but yeah. I'm generally optimistic. It's basically. that, it's that saved by the bell episode where Jesse takes, I think caffeine pills yep. and she says, I'm so, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so scared. I want to mention that you're <laughs> dating yourself with these references and then I understand it, them. So it's, it's all over. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Okay. Um, one of the greatest scenes in television history. <laughs> <laughs> that's a take that's a good take <laughs> well the whole thing about that was they were actually trying to genuinely educate the yep. audience on drugs and they realized that they couldn't have jesse take drugs <laughs> right. so she takes caffeine pills and has this which is actually on the nose because caffeine is terrible 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 it's terrible. Like actually an awful drug yeah we're just yeah. okay with it yeah so uh, jesse takes uh this caffeine pills to study for i believe the their they're in like high school, but they have a final exam. I don't know what it is, right? And she has a complete crash meltdown. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I grew up to that. Yep. So here I am. And probably never took drugs because of it. And probably never took drugs because of it. We're going to stick with Just that. Just like dare. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I never tried it. <laughs> what an... Un you know, how do we... Uh, that's a rabbit hole too. It's like... When I grew up, uh, an officer would come to your school and tell you if you smoke weed, you're going to die. And now it's like, Mom, I made a million dollars from selling pre-rolls. Oh, exactly. <laughs> it's that, like, what the fuck is going dare on? Dare is so problematic in hindsight. Like, you think back, it's like, that is such a such an interesting thing that they tried to do. Well, yeah. It's an interesting thing they tried to do, and then it just became completely irrelevant within our lifetimes. Yeah. Making me just question even more about the nature of reality that I engage with every day and just, <laughs> right. you know, you're it's like, all gonna change. how much t wasted time and energy, by the way, this is not me saying that this can like, I'm like into the cannabis industry or this is like, I just think it's, it's ludicrous. We spent half of our life learning that this is the thing that's going to kill you. you have friends go to jail yep. and now they sell it at the fucking Kmart down yep. the street. Well, you've um, still got football players in Texas getting arrested for weed which is really weird because it's so different by state. Right. I think it was like a Texas A&M player got arrested like last week. And I was like, for what now? And it was weed. And it was like, right. it must have been selling. It was, it was like a joint. It was like just not much. It was really interesting. Right. And meanwhile, you know, you, you go a few thousand miles and you can go to the, the uh, store that looks like the Apple store and buy friggin' whatever. <laughs> expensive stuff. lighting. Yeah. For sure. yeah. Yeah. Just like under shelf yeah, lighting. No, you, you just stop on the way home from work. Right. Along with everyone else stopping on the way home from work. <sighs> exactly. Drive throughs. Yeah. Yeah. But in, in me growing up, you know, that's just like you're just getting pulled over and they're using a microscope to look through oh, yeah. your car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how do you know that's not like a pine cone? <laughs> <laughs> Don't care. Don't care. <laughs> you're coming with me. Yeah. You seem. Ah, uh, the suspicious. suburbs. <laughs> mm, very much. The suburbs. Yeah. I think you're all the same. It's all like the small town cops next to a big city. Yeah. Well, you other know, rabbit hole police it, experiences over the last 40 years. Well, you know, what's interesting is Paul Graham. I don't know if you read the essay about the public school system in the United States. I, Paul Graham goes like way into this and he changed my mind. Really? Yeah. Paul Graham is like basically the public school system and the suburb system is not designed to educate. It's designed to just warehouse young, unruly people in the safest way, meaning a jail-like environment, yeah. possible. So keep them busy, keep them confused, 
and keep them under lock and key yep. until they become big enough to follow the rules of society. Uh, conformity and the uh, pressurized environment that high, the American high school is, his example is, I can't think of anything more r- ridiculous than watching an oblong ball go across a field because uh, for those who don't know, Paul Graham is uh, from the UK and had yep. moved from the UK. So anyway, he's he sees this from this distance and I think it was just really beautiful to overlay my own life and my own, you know, these things you take for granted. You're like, this is pretty random shit yeah. and it's pretty ineffective shit. Yeah. So the D.A.R.E. program being one of the weirder, yeah. m- you know, <laughs> loaded <words. laughs> aspects of, of that, but uh, just everything about the the stress and terror. I don't know. Did you have a, a lovely uh, high school experience? Or? No, I, um, I, my experience probably fits what he's explaining, which has been over the course of my life. I've been like school sucks for people like me. Um, however, we've adopted a bunch of kids from different backgrounds. And one of the things that we've now learned is that school's actually very good for some kids, particularly mm-hmm. behavioral issues, mm-hmm. um, public schools, especially, um, and it's not, it's not the same as what he's talking about. It wasn't school. Wasn't school. Didn't help me be successful. I don't think it was, it was kind of a pain and I wasn't good at it and I didn't do homework and I'm lucky I did okay on tests, I guess. Right. But, um, I think for what, what's been interesting with my kids is watching what it actually is good for. And we have, we've, when you, when I think when kids deal with certain problems among their peers or if they're autistic or have dyslexia or any number of other things, right. um, my desires for them have changed. It's not, I want them to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or whatever. I guess that's not even who you want them to be at this year anyway. (laughs) Jesus Christ. My references. What a terrible example. (laughs) I know. I'm sorry. (laughs) At least use Elon Musk. (laughs) No, even that's, no. Wait a second. I I mean, Bill Gates. Wait, no. God, what's wrong with these people? Uh, Who do I want them to be? I don't know. Uh, The mattress king of Chicago. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so far, I don't have any huge negatives for that one. So, uh, Just wait. Yeah, right. Exactly. Just wait till you see his fly list, his travel <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but it's changed for us from like, I just want them to be, have a chance to be successful at living at all. And right. not, it's not, it's not production based, which I think is when I've, there's a lot of, I think a lot of very smart people want to tackle the school system. And the thing I've learned about having kids that aren't just like me mm-hmm. is, is just how, how diverse the problem is for people. We actually, we were going to put our kids in private school and they actually turned us down. Mm-hmm. We sent them for interviews and they're like, no, this isn't uh, they told us one of our, our fifth grader at the time. They're like, she just doesn't seem like she wants to learn. Oh. I was like, oh my God, she's in fifth grade. Yeah. What the fuck That's, do you know? What does that even Asshole. mean? Yeah, exactly. So public school for us right now, because it's the, it's actually the best system for our particular kids needs, which I has see. been. It's a, it's tempered some of my more libertarian school takes. Okay. I think. Okay. Right. Because obviously when you're reading essays from Paul Graham, they're written by Paul Graham. Paul Graham <laughs> and his wife, Jessica, and they're really high functioning children that are going to be fine regardless of what anything. happens. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, and it's, it's a really interesting set of problems. I think that, um, I think, uh, well, I got, and when, when we sold the last company, I went back and talked to the investors I had, I was like, I'm going to do ed tech. They're like, don't everyone, everyone tries to do an education and blows it up and, and you fall. don't know yeah. what you're doing yeah. and it won't work. Do something, stay in your lane was the, the quote I got, which okay. was kind of funny. Um, cause I, I think everyone who makes money wants to fix education for, for younger them. Yeah. And undo the shit show. That was yeah. their experience. Yeah. I bridged the gap between not fitting in at all. My fr- my best friends kept moving away. It was yeah. like every time I had a, be- a best friend, they moved away. He's like, oh, oh I went to Detroit. That gets a little old. <laughs> I'm like, well, this sucks. Uh, and I was like on the fence of being kind of a, on the nerd side, but also I played lacrosse. I didn't play football. I played a sport. No one gave a shit about they, we started People started to care a lot more about it as it become, became more popular. But um, I was like, uh, I never really fit in, man. Right. And uh, I still don't, except then I cared. Now I don't. That's <laughs> yeah, the difference. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you're like, school sucks, gets better. And quite frankly, it you, doesn't really matter. It doesn't, no, you get better. You get better at coping with it is, is pretty much what happens. Yeah. I, so when I started improv in Chicago, it's funny because I'm 43 now. I started when I was like 37 and it's still basically classes full of 22 year olds that want to go on SNL. Yep. 
And even it was, it was exactly the same schools. Like these people are very different than me. They're after very different things. I'm nowhere near as good at them at what I want to be doing right now. It was, it was, um, it was a lot of repeats of that. And it's, it's the same way. I just don't, in this case, I could talk myself into not caring. There's still a part of me that's like, I want these people to like me and I want to be good at what I'm trying, but I've gotten much better at, at, at just not being good at stuff, which I think is maybe a good skill. Or makes Except, my life easier. Accepting us for who we are as yeah. the strange, it's unique, very, very Christian. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> it's 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 just you let yourself off the hook a little bit. Yeah, dude. I think that's probably the you know you don't have to be the guy that's got the coolest jeans and the also throws the fucking touchdown pass and all this shit. It's like you know if you could go back and tell your high school self, don't worry, I'm gonna sell a company to fucking IBM. Yeah, you know, you know what. I'm okay with that story. <laughs> it's a, you know what? And the whole time my brain's still just screaming at me. It wasn't like I, the, nothing about how I felt about life changed because of the events. It was just that I had a new, new set of events to react. To. Right. Well, listen, man, this is one of those, this is a slow burner. Cause now I'm, now I feel like we're on, we're on fire and we've got a hard stop as, oh, as no usual. Oh man. I, I wish I could stay here and talk to you more. Cause now I'm, we're getting into the real, the real meat of it. Oh yeah. Um, I don't, I was going to say, keep me up to date on what's going on with fly IO, but the truth is if it works, you won't fucking have to, <laughs> Right. That's fair. <laughs> I'll just be moving my servers over to you and it'll yeah. be, that'll be that. Yeah. Right. And I'll wave at you like from a distance. <laughs> just be like, yeah. hopefully I'm still accessible. I think <laughs> yeah, I'll just wave towards your general vicinity through yes. the guards and, uh, just know I'm probably dying inside because I didn't like my improv class. That day. <laughs> exactly. like regardless of how it looks from the outside. Right. Priorities, uh, priorities are still priorities. Yes, exactly. Yeah, man. Kurt, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This is great. See you soon.